overall seems pretty simple. Uh, yeah, gonna assemble my sub pod finally. Why? You don't like my worms? They're a part of this family, Jason. Their room's outside. Hi, welcome to my unboxing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One's coming out. Shh. You open it outside. Wait, I have to open it in here. Worm advisory. Your worms have been shipped in dry peat moss. If the worm seems small and scrawny, this is normal. It has been an on average of four days since they have had food or water. They will regain their original size and strength within two days as long as they receive the instructed amount of hydration. I get 10% off my next worm purchase. Okay, cool. Since my worm friends arrived in the evening um, and I can't really see what's going on in the backyard, I'm going to plant them tomorrow. Plant them. I'm going to release them tomorrow. Uh, so they'll be staying indoors, Jason. Um, I rehydrated the cocoa core. It's, uh, it filled this entire thing. And uh, I'm putting this on top so, putting this on top so it'll be ready for tomorrow. Okay, it's warm time. This smells kind of gross. <laughs> oh, wow. Ew. Ew. Um, those worms look dead. No. As someone who's not really squeamish around bugs and things like that, that was gross. That was disturbing. Also, like, worms are living creatures. 1,000 of them just died. 1,000 of them. Technically, like a few of the worms survived. Like I saw like a couple moving. Imagine you're a worm and you're in this dark bag with like 480 other worms, but they're dead. I'm gonna try to get another batch of worms for my composting. Ugh. I have to put off acclimating worms for another probably week. Oh, okay. <sighs> worms round two came. I open the bag immediately upon arrival and pour a half cup of water on your worms to begin the rehydration process. Um, but it doesn't say if you should be putting it like directly in like the compost bin and pouring water on it or if you should just like, I don't know, put them in a bowl or something. I'm assuming that you just like put them in. So worms should be introduced to their new environment as soon as possible. Place them in the center of your garden compost bin or a compost pile sprinkle with water and cover them with moist newspaper, peat moss, or topsoil. Okay. PETA is smelling the worms. Oh my God. PETA. Are those worms? These worms? Are these worms? 
time to put worms in my composter? Okay. just learned that worms that are dead can mold and that is what they've done so I need to scoop out moldy worms oh my god oh they're alive <laughs> yeah. it's alive it's alive already buds here you go here's your new home whoa they're moving. Whoa! Any worms in here left? No worm left behind. It's alive. So, next group of worm. Okay. Oh, that's a really dry mix. Okay. Is it alive? Yep. So, I just pour some water on top. Splash Mountain. Do they need food? No, so they can't eat for a couple days. Okay, I'm gonna tuck you in bed. It's called a worm blanket. Who oh, is it? <laughs> you wanna keep that, reuse it? No. Pack some, uh... Ew. It smells nasty. It smells like worms. I didn't know what worms smelled like until now. We're trying to kill the grass in our backyard, and so we picked up a ton of cardboard boxes. Uh, yeah, this is, um, we were looking at different methods for killing grass, and this one seemed to be like the most, I guess, like not using chemicals. So we're just laying them down here, and then on top we'll go mulch, and then we're trying to actually convert this to pea gravel. So it's just like muddy mess everywhere. And then like, Intermittently between like the hard rains, it would actually just get stagnant and then this thick layer of algae would start growing. It smelled awful and then our dog tried drinking out of it, so <laughs> that's not good. Yeah, it's a rainy day. Um, normally I'd be pretty annoyed, <laughs> but it's actually great because the cardboard boxes need to have, like need to be sprayed down, um, but we're just gonna let the rain do it. So yeah, hopefully we can get rid of the marshiness of this area by adding a uh, substance to it that will allow it to like drain down more underneath the pea gravel eventually. how compact this stuff is in here so it has all the curved panels here and then all of the uh, straight panels here are here here
that definitely breaks it up. Oh, perfect. bought some praying mantis babies. Mantis typically hatch within three to five weeks depending on the air temperature. Each egg case will produce approximately 200 juvenile mantises. I know praying mantises are used as a form of natural pest control. Uh, they're great because they aren't really interested in your vegetation, more so the things that are on your vegetation that you're trying to get rid of. So it can kind of help in a more natural organic way of farming. Um, also, I remember when I was a kid, uh, living at my grandparents' place. Uh, it used to be filbert orchards, and so one of the methods that they would do to take care of pests was actually to unleash a ton of praying mantises. So um, every once in a while I would find one, and in fact when I was, uh, I think in fifth grade or fourth grade maybe, um, I came across my first ever praying mantis and I was just mesmerized by it. I think they're so cool. They're my absolute favorite bug, and I actually, this is not not so kind to it but I wanted to keep it as a pet so I got a little bug terrarium and I hunted down and found grasshoppers to feed it because they among the things that they eat are grasshoppers as well um, and I would always pick one and put it in there and then <laughs> one day I thought I would you know get on the meal prep train and I put two in and it died and I kind of think that maybe the grasshoppers like ganged up on it so I feel really bad his name is Manny Annie the Mantis. Maybe in my persimmon tree? This is maybe a good spot. Just gotta kinda like wedge it in. And then we'll have mantis babies. <laughs> I'm so excited. Okay. Wow. Really weird looking. Okay, so this is the egg sack. So what we've been doing today is um, first of all, I don't know where I got my calculations that I would need seven yards of soil. That's a lot of soil. So in order to take advantage of the soil, uh, we decided to actually turn the retaining wall area into a food forest or a mini food forest of sorts. So um, yeah, I was mapping it out last night, all the different things I want to put in. Um, it's definitely going to be a mix of non-native and native species. So for instance, our base is got Korean pear tree here. Uh, we've got omija over here. Uh, we've got two types of blueberries down here, uh, we've got Legacy, and we've got Chandler. Uh, persimmon tree right here. I've also got three yuzu trees. Yeah, the goal now is to just fill it in with shrubbery and bushes and herbs. But the reason I chose some non-native species is because, uh, well, they're really important to uh, Jason's like food culture, like the foods that he really loves and um, as well as his parents who are gonna be moving here with us. So I thought it'd be really impactful to be able to grow it here rather than having to have it shipped over from, you know, Korea, Japan, China, wherever they come from. Um, so yeah, we're gonna have like a genyip corner uh, and then the, like at the base, we're gonna do gomchui and then I'm gonna have some chinamol over here and I'm gonna kind of fill in with some stuff that I like too. So I have like some currant plants and I have a, an elderberry over here. So um, really excited. Thank you. 
Oh, no. I know. <laughs> no! <laughs> you just got it. Oh. Okay. <laughs>